Do you like my new handbag? This was actually recommended by Mike of Mike's Electric Stuff. He said, it's pink, it's got electronics in it. It sounds just a thing for your channel. So before we go any further, I'm going to show you what this does. And to do that, I'm going to have to turn the light off here. And we shall demonstrate the pattern. So I'll press the test button in the front and it's got a LED video wall that displays various program patterns. Plus, you can actually put your own patterns in via an interesting interface. So it comes with these uh, pre-programmed patterns for demo. Uh, let's get the light back. So that was in demo mode. So this thing is a tie-in to a television production called Project MC2. Or is that MC squared? Not sure, but it's basically ladies involved in nefarious spy activities. And as part of their uh, sort of merchandise range, they had this handbag purse thing and various other gadgets. And the reviews are very interesting because they range from a load of rubbish. It is a piece of plastic. Can't put a phone in the car while using phone case. It's too expensive for what it is. I do not recommend this product. Very disappointing. Most definitely not a bag to carry around. Expensive and of very limited use. And then it comes to a much more appropriate review which says, cheapest way to buy a 16 by 32 LED panel. Really, the cheapest way to buy a 16 by 32 LED panel, it also comes with a diffuser, which is really handy. Maker Spaces, members across UK must have made up most of the sales. The bag itself is utter tat, made of genuine nasty plastic, and to clarify, cannot be used as a bag. And to be fair, there are other reviews where people have bought this for the kids, and the kids are technically inclined, and they've really loved it, particularly because of the tie-in with the series. So when we open it, and this thing, it looks like some a sort of soft, flexible fabric. That's what I thought it was going to be. It's got a big, chunky plastic zip. When you pull it to the side, it undoes a latch and pops the back open. So let's uh, hinge this down, take a look inside. And at this point, you can see it is mostly a big plastic thing. Not much room for anything except your mobile phone, which sits in this uh, clamp here. And then you've got a lead which plugs into the headphone port. Now, I'm guessing that means that if you download the app, and I've not downloaded the app because uh, I'm going to take this to bits. I'm not going to start programming it. But the app just lets you basically pick colours and then draw sort of images, write your name in the screen and stuff like that, and then download the image. And I'm guessing it does it with audio signals, maybe uh, FSK, frequency shift keying, where they, they switch uh, between two tones and uh, the length of each tone uh, is either a one or a zero, so that's the, the divider is the fact it changes frequency. It means it can put data through at high speed. Not sure. Um, it's got a battery compartment which holds four double A's and a switch which goes from try me to off and on. So uh, it's in try me mode there, so when you push the button in the front, it will uh, do its little test pattern for a while. And then sort of go into sleep mode again. So I'll take these batteries out at the moment because I'm about to take it to bits. So I'll stick those batteries out of the way and let's just start taking things out because I am very intrigued by this uh, video panel. And Mike makes electric stuff. I know that he bought one of these. They were selling them for about, uh, online the price was reduced from possibly as high as £60 down to £20. I got this one on eBay for about 15 I think it was, plus shipping. And the construction of it is quite clever. It's It really looks like a sort of handbag in the moulding of the plastic and the way the zip mechanism pushes this catch back when you pull the zip back and then this plastic pin pushes it open is quite neat. A lot of thought has gone into this. But we are, of course, mainly interested in the circuitry and this video wall. Because Mike has confirmed that it is a proper video wall panel. Very intriguing. It kind of shows how far video walls have come when you can actually get them built into stuff like this. Okay, ooh. So what we got here? Oh. Oh, that's the button that interfaces to the front. Right, oh. This is uh, a bit cumbersome. Oh, right, okay, the whole lot's come out. That's excellent. That's kind of what we want. So here is the LED panel. 
which has the driver circuitry in the back. It's got the positions, the connectors, and as Mike said, they've omitted one of the connectors just to keep the price down because it's not needed. So um, I'm not sure what these take in. Is it parallel they take in or is it actually a dedicated protocol? The circuit board here has a blob chip. Really? They were able to justify probably putting a microcontroller in there. These, I'd guess, well, let's uh, find out what the numbers are. I'd guess one is probably going to be a memory chip. What have we got? What have we got? I'm reading them all upside down. This is not particularly helpful. F40A104GP. Not sure what that is. Let's uh, switch the magnification up a little bit here. F40A104G1P, possibly P17724H. Uh, the chip is the manufacturer's Cepheon. And this one is a. 35025, oh, 3502 EM, 3502. Uh, I'm going to check up and see if I can find anything about these. The investigation is complete. The only mystery chip is what's under this, this rather squint blob here. I'm guessing it will be a general purpose microcontroller because there's a serial programming port here for, for programming it. The other two chips on here, well, there's actually three chips on here. There's a little uh, low dropout voltage regulator feeding that chip. There's a memory chip, quite an odd memory chip. It's the F40A-104GITP uh, memory chip. And then we've got a power regulator chip for driving the LED display itself. And it's got the, some components in the back, including this inductor. There's also a crystal in the back. But apart from the few components, that, uh, the capacitors, that inductor and the crystal, there's nothing else in the back. The other area that has a bit of extra circuitry is the connection to the headphone cable. And it turns out that it's got three connections. It's got the microphone ground and the right audio. So I'm guessing the right audio is data coming into this unit and the microphone is being used for sending data back or control signals. Excellent. And there's a little offboard button here, and that pretty much sums that up. But then we get on to the spicy bit. Uh, this other board here is just purely a switch. That's all, just for setting modes. This is a much more interesting, this video ball module. It has a system for putting data along it where the it's divided into two. And you can find uh, information on this online. In fact, Adafruit stock these and have a interface for this style of board for connecting it to Arduinos and software routines for putting uh, stuff up in it. So you could, technically speaking, you could get these things and then just get them up and running with uh, the information on Adafruit's site. But all these chips are completely standard. These are MOSFETs designed to drive what I'm guessing is two rows at once. Each one will be switching two rows. But the the chip that's driving them is a 328 decoder. I thought, although these are dual MOSFETs, I thought they might actually be uh, using them to drive individually, individual rows. The, is it 16? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Yes, it is. So I thought they might initially have been driving them as a, a full 16 outputs, but it looks as though... There is only one uh, 3 to 8 pin decoder, which may be uh, then scanning that. These chips here are LED drivers. They're designed to take serial data in and then put it out to the LEDs. And there are enough of them to actually, each one can handle 16 channels. And if you consider that uh, we've got 32 LEDs with three channels each, uh, that comes out to about 100 LEDs. Um, and they've kind of divided this. The data is fed as two RGB streams and the board appears to be divided into two. So they're transferring information across the top section and across the top bottom section. There are also two uh, octal transceivers here, which I'm guessing maybe for switching the serial data control signals through to the outgoing port because I'm just presuming this, it's most likely how it works because video walls just tend to loop together like this. 
that data will come in from the processor and get shifted along X number of panels. And once it's actually shifted the data across, it will then enable the output. And this thing has the three reds, uh, should I say, the red, green, blue top, red, green, blue bottom. It's got a clock data and uh, it's got various other control signals for the, mul the multiplexing. And it will put the information about out uh, as wide as the screen is. It will send those pixel information bits along until it's filled the whole serial uh, array, not just in this card, but in the adjacent cards. And then it will put that information out, but it will also select which of the columns is going to be lit. Now I'm thinking this, uh, it's probably with these, uh, the way these MOSFETs are arranged, it's possibly, and the fact there are two uh, separate blocks across here, it's probably uh, sort of line one will light at the same time as line one of the second display and it will go like that, it will scan through them like that. Uh, what else is there on here that's a, a surprise? Nothing. Capacitors, there's no polarity protection. That's not really much a surprise because it would be quite fierce if there was. They can't just stick a diode in the series because this uh, board, if fully lit, would take a good few amps. It would take a lot of current uh, if all the LEDs were at full white, if it was being used as a full-on uh, video wall panel, because this is capable of a uh, fairly high output, but it's not being used for that here. They're deliberately keeping the intensity down uh, to keep the power consumption low, and also because you don't want to blind people with your pink video wall handbag. But all these chips are standard. Uh, the LED drivers are SM1610SC. The MOSFETs here are GS4953. Um, the transceivers are... Um, let me see, what was the transceivers? I had some data here. 8-bit transceiver, uh, they're based on the SIM4HC245. Hold on. SM245TS was the number on them. Uh, what else? This is a standard uh, TTL chip. Uh, that is the SIM4HC138D. It uh, can take three, pin, three lines in and then decode it to the eight outputs for driving the sets of MOSFETs. And that is fundamentally it. It's a fairly dumb display. It's not going to store data. You can't just send an image to it and have it just sit there displaying it. You're going to have to continually stream data out on each of the two halves as uh, full lines, the full length of the display, and then display that line and then go down to the next line, display that. And I'm guessing that the eight uh, channels of uh, multiplexing is going to take a lot of strain off the LEDs in the sense that um, with multiplexing, there's always a risk if something goes wrong and it stops multiplexing, it leaves one line lit if the processor crashes. You don't want to multiplex too many channels because that then suddenly that line is drawing a lot of current. You can sometimes see that on displays that have stopped multiplexing and they're really, really bright. It's not good for them at all. But uh, this is uh, very neat, and uh, Adafruit has the stuff you need to actually use these boards. So you could either buy the boards from Adafruit, or you could buy loads of plastic handbags and rip the boards out, as I believe has been happening, and then just find the data and uh, the little interface shield and stuff like that from Adafruit. So it's very neat, very smart. I'm going to have to have a wee play around with this. It's it's quite interesting, but it does appear to be an off-the-shelf standard video wall panel. That's neat. Very neat.